uh, so uh, continuing on uh, uh, time sync that I started on a week ago. Uh, so uh, I talked about how sort of there are multiple factors that end up affecting the quality with which uh, a time sync will happen. One of them obviously is the clock source itself, and then there are other factors like the protocol, how often you're synchronizing and things like that. Um, I had brought up uh, this concept of Allen deviation and how that can be used to characterize the clock. And in particular, the main thing to uh, look at is that certain clocks are good uh, or acceptable uh, over short term time horizon, but their long term stability isn't that great. And then there are others which short term are not that great, but if you give them more time, then they become more uh, higher quality. So like for example, NTP is pretty bad at short time scales because it takes time to convert, but over long times it becomes pretty good. So when you're starting out, uh, you might just be better off using, let's say, just a regular crystal oscillator or things like that. But over long term, uh, the fact that NTP does let you sync with uh, high accuracy clocks and servers uh, lets you win out. Uh, GPS, same story. Uh, over short term, you will see lots of deviation on GPS just because of the measurement errors that are involved. But long term, again, you uh, benefit quite a bit, and of course, even more so than NTP, uh, and so and so forth. Uh, uh, even atomic clocks and things like that, they also over short term show a little bit of wandering of the clock edges. Uh, so you need to essentially average things out over long term so to get uh, the requisite stability. Now, with all of this, the question then becomes, um, and hopefully the answer is obvious in light of our discussion, why don't we simply use NTP or GPS um, in all our systems? I mean, they are uh, sort of quite, uh, uh, they, they, they provide some pretty uh, good capabilities. And I guess the main thing is it's a combination of um, uh, precision scope, uh, that is, over what area and for what time and the accuracy that you need. And dif different applications uh, have it um, uh, exhibit very diverse characteristics in terms of these. And also when you combine with it the power budget that you are willing to pay. So take GPS for example. So problem with GPS is the following, that uh, GPS is, so it's, no doubt it's very high precision. I mean, if you look back out here in this slide, um, GPS does pretty well um, and long term is really, really, very really stable. Um, but GPS receivers are, uh, let's say, order of one watt, okay? Uh, and even ignoring the price, uh, they also have the issue that they only work outdoors. Um, and the most important issue is so, if normally when power is high, your inclination would be that, hey, how about? We duty cycle the GPS. So we uh, shut it down, uh, and the next time when we need time, we wake it up. The problem with that is the so called GPS lock time. So when you wake up the GPS, it has to look for the satellites. <coughs> and it used to be that GPS's, GPS might take as much as uh, a minute or two to find the lock from a cold start which pretty much rules out the possibility that you're going to wake it if you're duty cycling at the rate of like once every 15 seconds, once every minute, uh, it's not going to work. You have to wake up, wait for two minutes for it to lock, get the reading just for you to go back to sleep. Uh, things have improved significantly, uh, but there are a couple of different factors which come into play when GPS has to look for satellites. One is that uh, you need lock on multiple satellites. And if you don't have any prior knowledge of where the satellites are, in effect, you have to search all over the sky for the satellites. Um, the second thing is uh, you do need to lock to multiple satellites. So if your hardware is sequential, namely one satellite at a time, uh, once you are locked in, then, then you have to track them. So if your hardware is sequential, then um, you basically are going to take more time. So two things sort of help in that regard. Uh, one is that you somehow have some prior knowledge of where the satellites are roughly so that you can focus your search in that direction as opposed to looking all over the visible sky. Uh, the, uh, and, and there are a couple of ways you can do it. If you have some other network connectivity, uh, like let's say a cellular connection or an internet connection, then some something else can tell you that right now 
given your rough location, like cellular network can say, given your rough location, the satellites are, uh, that, that's the rough location, or the satellites and you can focus there. The other thing which happened is that um, to track the satellites, in essence, you need a very high speed correlator, which kind of correlates, uh, match, tries to match the code for a specific satellite. So modern receivers have the capability of tracking multiple satellites simultaneously. So they can hunt for multiple satellites together, and once they lock on, they can keep track of them. Um, this also has the advantage that if you're able to lock on to one satellite quicker than the other, then you are winning as opposed to perhaps investing in you know, satellites which might, you might take longer to uh, lock or maybe you are even blocked because of a tall building or something. So GPS receivers have improved significantly, but still they take time. Uh, another concept that uh, some, uh, in certain context, uh, people have begun to explore is the concept of um, if, if you do not need the location currently, if all you need is that you want to log the location. Uh, so that later on you can come back to it and do something. So like people who, let's say, might be keeping track of, like scientists often keep track of animal movement and things like that. So in that case, you don't actually have to process the GPS data immediately if you just capture sufficient data, which then you can post-process. So uh, a couple of um, Microsoft had sort of a couple of papers along this line, and there's a company which marketed something called fast lock GPS. That brings it down to five seconds, but that's pretty much where the uh, state of the art is. And even that, with the five second, it is for uh, post uh, after the fact figuring out of the location. You don't do it on the fly. Uh, so uh, NTP, uh, long term very good. Uh, short term, you're looking at errors in milliseconds, tens of milliseconds. So it plays. Uh, uh, on the other hand, lots of our applications are now headed into the territory where we need microsecond or even nanosecond uh, scale time synchronization, uh, measuring RF time of flight, coordinating actions. Uh, some millisecond is pretty ex extremely uh, extremely common, uh, even in factory automation and those sort of things. Um, so there are lots of these applications where uh, NTP and GPS with the characteristics don't quite cut, cut it. Uh, there are also applications where you need to do things over much longer period uh, and your precision may be lower. So that brings the other point, which is uh, over the course of a system, you may have different requirements in terms of time sync, whereas uh, things like NTP are kind of best effort. Namely, they do the best they can, but there is no particular accuracy that they seek to achieve. Uh, so, uh, uh, so what that has led to in recent decade or so uh, is a fair bit of work which happened, which catered to these more uh, specialized regimes. Okay, so lower power, higher accuracy, more rapid uh, synchronization, wireless, those kind of issues. So let's look at what is in, uh, what is involved in. Uh, uh, make getting things, getting clocks synchronized. So uh, in a very crude form, the problem basically is I have a bunch of clocks. Um, each one of them has an oscillator and some sort of a counter. Uh, and uh, these things are connected by a network. And your goal is to achieve some kind of synchronization. And as we saw, there are three sort of core forms of synchronization. I may be interested in synchronizing the frequencies. I may be interested in synchronizing the phase and therefore frequency as well. And then finally, I might be interested in synchronizing time, which in turn means I uh, also have frequency and phases, right? Um, so uh, basically, you can think of this problem as a problem of calibrating clocks. So we talk about calibration in context of sensors. Uh, I ask sensor a measurement, it gives me a reading, and I want to then relate it to the physical quantity of interest. So like, for example, if I have a light sensor, then deep down it is probably, let's say, a uh, photoresistor. Uh, it gives me a current value or resistance value, and then I say, okay, it corresponds to some light level lux. And you will have some sort of a mapping between the electrical value and the actual light value. Same thing out here, that our hardware, at the end of the day, is basically giving us some sort of a count. 
and I need to transform that into a no agreed upon notion of time. And that mapping, uh, how should I map the counter which is being triggered uh, on a periodic basis by a timer driven by my local clock, I need to find a function which takes that counter reading and maps it to my time coordinate of interest. So let's say the time coordinate of interest is UTC, what's that mapping? So it's a calibration problem. Uh, and uh, the uh, challenge arises from that these clocks or deep down the oscillator and whatever mechanism we are using to read out uh, has imperfections of the type that we saw in the previous slide set. Uh, and they broadly fall into following categories. Um, initial offset, that is, uh, the starting values of the different counters and the different nodes are not the same. They power up at different times, so they start at different, different values. Um, the drift, namely the rate at which time at different nodes are adva uh, is advancing is uh, different uh, and it changes over time. Uh, so this is basically all the issues surrounding frequency, that is frequency, the, the oscillators have manufacturing differences and they react differently to temperature and other ambient conditions. So what you can think of as the following, so I have a local counter or local clock uh, and at any point in time, so at any point in some globally agreed upon time, my clock is going to show some uh, some value c of t and the rate at which that c of t is advancing <coughs> is the frequency that I have, that's omega of t. So that's my local frequency. So you can turn it around and you can basically say that at any given point in time the counter value that I'm going to be seeing is going to be my starting value plus from start until now the integral of this time varying frequency component. And this, uh, this is time varying again because both manufacturing errors as well as whatever ambient situations uh, this clock might have encountered. Now, what, now let's switch gears and think about what the application means. So what application uh, through hardware and operating system and APIs and all has access to is a C of T and even that it has access to in some, some corrupted form in the sense that when we read C of T through because of delays and um, operating system calls and all, what I may actually get they already have some quantization and some other quantification, but let's ignore that for the moment. Uh, what do applications typically need? If you think about the kind of time services applications need, they fall into a few common bins, okay? So one very common usage is the following, I want to know what the global time is, okay? So I'm able to read my local clock, the local C of T or CI of T, and I need to figure out what the time is in that <coughs> agreed upon coordinate system. Okay, so in a sense, let's say that I'm interested in a function which maps my C of C of T to the actual to the to the value T that we have agreed upon. Um, another one, uh, and, and this one obviously is uh, useful simply tell me the time of the day right now. The reverse selection is also very useful. Uh, mapping uh, two local times. So there is a global time, and I want to map it, map it to the time that uh, that is there on my local clock. When do you think this might be useful? What kind of situations? So we are in reverse direction. We are saying when it is 5 p.m. January 1st, 2016. What is the counter value? You want to set up some timer events. Yeah, just want to set up some timer events, right? Want to schedule something. Uh, we both agreed that we are going to do something together in the global coordinate system and now I need to set up an interrupt on my local hardware so that, uh, okay. Now this is obviously challenging if it's in the future because we don't know omega of t going into the future because it depends upon ambient conditions and aging and things like that. But that mapping is certainly useful in many applications. And then uh, another very common one is that I want to, uh, instead of a global time, I may just temp, uh, just two nodes in the network want to have a private uh, agreement that they want to do something together. Okay, so it might be two robots roaming around and they want to do something. They don't care about whether it is UTC and all. It's just a related time that matters to them. And you can think of a lot of other things. Maybe all I want is that 
if I measure a duration and you measure a duration, we both measure the same duration. We don't care about whether our times are synced or not. Okay, so there are many different kinds of applications in these that you might imagine that exist. Now, of course, if I have the ability to do these two mappings and everything else in a way follows, except that having a globally agreed upon time uh, coordinate system comes with its own issue. So let's say, for example, I have, I have deployed some sensors in this building and all they need to do is some relative synchronization, like for example, at the same time the two lights will blink, okay, or something like that. Well, why do they even care that they have any knowledge of UTC? Because that in turn will require some sort of connectivity out to the external world, that's unnecessary. So, uh, so oftentimes it's just relative time saying whether a network is all that we care about. So the canonical problem of time synchronization, uh, uh, as I pointed out, is one of calibration. And when you calibrate something, it really basically boils down to making repeated measurement and learn a model. Okay, and then you apply that model, and as that model changes over time, you sort of keep making additional measurements, and measurements come at a cost, so you want to keep that at to minimum. So the, strat the one strategy you can say is the following. Let, so let's say there are two nodes who want to synchronize. So one way we can say is measure the offset between neighbors at certain time intervals. So what we do is we somehow figure out a way of measuring uh, at some time t what the offset is between the two nodes involved i and j. So at node i there is a counter value, at the uh, clock value <coughs> node j is the clock value and we are measuring their offset, okay? Now, if there was no drift and uh, uh, clock frequencies were absolutely identical and okay, then and I'm able to make this measurement perfectly, then my synchronization problem is solved. We do it once and then for eternity we are synchronized. The problem which occurs is that neither is this measurement uh, possible to do accurately, nor, uh, nor are the clocks perfect and not the same. So then what basically boils down to the following, that we have to make, we have to either learn or have a model of the clock or the clocks in this case, which basically means the oscillators and stuff like that. And then somehow I need to also, uh, the second thing is somehow I also need to figure out how much error my measurements had, okay? And then uh, be able to project out in time. So in essence, I have a model of the clock, which I have either learned or knew somehow, and I have some historical measurements of these OI day of T. And then using this information, somehow I need to be able to say what the offset between two clocks is at some arbitrary time tau. Okay, so that's that's basically what we have what we have to figure out. Okay, and uh, this arbitrary time tau can either be in the future or it could be something in the past, but it's in between two measurements. Okay, so that's so at, I did not actually make a measurement at time tau. I made measurements in neighborhood uh, and I even if I had a, even if I had a measurement at tau, that measurement could be noisy and flaky. So, therefore, I still have a uh, I st still have a problem. So, uh, uh, so so let 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 let's see how sort of we can uh, make that happen. So, one approach to synchronization and uh, which is kind of a simplistic, uh, most simple concept, very simple one is that we aim for global <coughs> clock synchronization. So we aim for all the clocks, all the nodes in my network always being synchronized. And uh, uh, the way we kind of do it is that, uh, so remember I talked about two things. We need to learn the offset, and then also we need to somehow have a model of the clock. Now, a static model of the clock is not going to work for reasons that we have seen aplenty, namely if, our, if node A is trying to synchronize with node B, it really has no prior knowledge about other nodes characteristics. Okay, now you could imagine a conceptual framework at least like the following, that every node's clock is calibrated as in, in the factory. So it has some sort of a data sheet where it <coughs> we know about how it ages, at given temperature, what its frequencies are, all the relevant things. So I have a model of 
both nodes clocks and when the nodes need to synchronize they exchange this information so node a will say these are the characteristics of my clock node b will say these are the characteristics of its clock and then we reconcile the two and then i have the information about relative drift and all you still have a problem of knowing the temperature and other parameters that might affect frequency but you could imagine doing that way. but that's uh, painful for a variety of reasons because we don't have a situation that clocks carry their own data streams. So even clock characteristics, we need to somehow learn how the clocks are drifting. So a typical way you might imagine this can be done is the following. I make some measurements to get the offset. So those measurements I have shown in terms of delta t. Okay, so these are the times at which uh, I am measuring the offset between the two clocks. And bear in mind that these measurements of delta t are not going to be perfect. They themselves are going to have errors. We'll see why later on, but basically uh, they involve time stamping messages, sending the messages back and forth. Uh, so you have delays in the network, you have time stamping errors, you have all those kind of issues. Then additionally, we may have some measurements made purely for the purposes of measuring frequency drift or how the clocks are drifting apart. And that, as I will shortly show, requires a uh, lesser amount of information exchange between the nodes. So we have measurements corresponding to what's of offset between the two clocks, and we have measurements which help us estimate the drift. And once I estimate the drift, I can train a model of the <coughs> clock. So I can basically say, relative to this other node, my clock is drifting in this particular fashion right now, and I'll keep revising it. If that other node is the UTC, uh, the global time, then it is relative, relative to that. So what NTP does, for example, is it maintains a very sophisticated model of the local clock, uh, which it learns from the previous measurements it has made. And then using this, it then develops that mapping that I talked about in the previous slide between my uh, counter I have and the actual UTC time. So it kind of can go back and forth. So why do errors happen? So um, if you think about whether it's wired or wireless, um, if I'm going to measure the clock offset, it's fundamentally going to involve I generating uh, node A generating some sort of an event according to its clock, and then node B somehow seeing when that event happened, what was the time at its clock and then comparing the two. That's pretty much the only way you can imagine doing things. So that in turn means we have to send some messages, okay? Uh, the problem that occurs is that sending these messages in networks, there are multiple sources of errors, both in the delay as well as in the time stamping. So let's look at, let's imagine the following. Let's say one node is sending a message and uh, we want to time stamp when the message was sent timestamp when the message was received and the idea is we are going to compare these timestamps to say something about clock offset. So if you look at the whole path that a packet will take, um, there will be some software components, some application, device driver, those kind of things. Then typically either in <coughs> software or inside the network interface card, there will be a medium access control protocol which will typically have a queue in which the packet will sit there until the time to transmit comes, namely the channel is free or the time slot occurs. Then the actual transmission happens, in which case those bits are modulated into uh, some sort of signal processing, and then the stuff is squirted out over the antenna. Then it goes over the channel, so that's the propagation delay. Then it's on the receive side, as the radio signal is coming in, it's demodulated. Uh, usually these algorithms themselves can be variable delay because uh, they may involve coding, demodulation schemes, and oftentimes there is a search process, so that delay can be variable. And then finally, uh, it will uh, be deposited into some sort of an interrupt. The software will get interrupted, or maybe it's falling, and then the software will get the packet. So now if you think about uh, uh, what, uh, what kind of errors we might see in timestamps, uh, done by the sender and time stamping of the same packet done by the receiver, part of the answer would depend upon where is the time stamp happening. So if the time stamp is happening at application level, 
then these all these delays that we are talking about, they are going to come into play. So propagation delay is reasonably fixed in a single hop wire or wireless link, but if this is a network, then uh, it might vary. If you have multipath, namely signal can bounce around different ways, then again this can vary because it could be one packet goes through directly, and then I moved a little bit, the next packet is taking a longer path. Uh, Px and Rx, uh, the electronic delay, Px tends to be relatively constant, but receives delay depending upon the modulation encoding uh, may exhibit very little amount of delay. Uh, queuing delay in MAC can be very significant, and then the software delays could be quite significant as well. So upshot of all of this is that the timestamps that you are going to see, depending upon how you're implementing, where you're implementing, can be uh, can be all over the map. So. Uh, Traditionally, when you are working over NTP and Ethernet and uh, or Wi-Fi, then time stamping is done at the extreme software level. Okay, and uh, but to improve time stamping, uh, the lower or closer to propagation you can do the time stamping, the better off you are. So ideally, you would want a specific bit in the packet to be time stamped, just as it is going out over the air, and you want the same bit to be time stamped just as it is arriving out of the air. Now, of course, that's not possible because we haven't demodulated the bits. So usually, the best you can do is to timestamp at the MAC CX boundary here so that all the delays up there is eliminated, uh, the variance in that, and likewise, you timestamp out here. So what you would see is that uh, network interfaces, radios, or Ethernet chips, which are designed specifically to support high precision timing, what they do is they usually have some sort of a signal which is going to mark the departure or arrival of a specific place in the packet. Okay, so usually it is the last byte of the header or um, last byte of the packet or some some well-known uh, well point in the packet. And what the radio will do is it will have some sort of pen will say that's the event that happened and likewise out here uh, at the boundary of, of at the Rx there would be something similar. So so now we have a more deterministic timing uh, kind of thing that you could do. But uh, normally um, like if you're just writing a time time sync thing on your uh, running on, uh, on top of existing Ethernet or radio then you don't have that degree of control uh, over this. So. Uh, so, so you need to have specific time stamping support or uh, in the hardware and that time stamping support at the bare minimum would be this kind of a signal. Some newer Ethernet chips have the capability that they, when the packet arrives or the packet departs, they actually internally have a, not only have a high precision clock, but they also have a counter. So they actually, uh, according to that clock, they get a time stamp. And then they can send that timestamp in another packet, or they can propagate it up to the software. So you can, uh, when you do normal uh, socket programming, you can basically tell it include the timestamp in it. So there's going to be some option that basically says that, along with the packet, also tell me the timestamp that it's going to arrive. So, uh, so low-level timestamping uh, at these boundaries has been uh, uh, has, is, is, is something which has emerged in recent years as uh, providing support. So again, both wireless and Ethernet. I haven't seen this kind of stuff in Wi-Fi yet, but uh, it's just a matter of time because uh, sort of the needs are uh, equally equally well there as well. So uh, then. Uh, comes the question, what about the remaining issues? So we still have Px propagation and Rx, okay? Now, a challenge which often comes to the following, and we'll see kind of why it matters, that these delays are not something that we necessarily know beforehand. So imagine the following. I have two nodes. Uh, let, let's say I've created a protocol which is going to synchronize nodes, uh, but there might be I might at different times be talking to nodes from different vendors. So maybe once I'm talking to a Zigbee chip from Texas Instruments, and the next time I'm talking to a Zigbee chip from Atmel, and a third time a Zigbee 
same problems. About yet another company. So even though superficially they're all following the same standard, the implementation details will differ. So that delay is different. Propagation delay also begins to matter once you are down to nanosecond type uh, synchronization because uh, I think I mentioned nanosecond every point, point 0.3 meter. So uh, if you're looking at let's say 100 meter distance, that's a reasonable number of nanoseconds right there. Uh, so, so somehow we need to, even even if you're able to time step at this lower level, we still need to know something about these characteristics. So there are basically <coughs> two things you can do. You either can measure, or you can have things be pre-characterized. So, uh, so one of the more uh, successful and visible time synchronization protocol I mentioned. I think previously also something called FTST out of um, uh, uh, Vanderbilt University. So the way they did was the following. They pre-characterize these delays. So essentially, they, so they were working with a specific radio and they basically in the lab, very careful experiments and all, they characterized uh, delay which occurred in the transmission reception. So that's the TX, the propagation and the RX, okay? And they kind of uh, sort of had some assumption about the area over which they were working. And then additionally, the other thing they did was, since in a network setting, it may be that the two nodes are not one hop apart, but are having to go through intermediate nodes. So what they also do is, in the intermediate nodes, they did a tallying of the delays. So if, if A is sending to B, but it is sending it through a relay R, then the relay R it was going to do a precise accounting of when the packet arrived at the relay and when the, from A and when the packet was sent from relay to B. And that delay which happened at the relay, it is going to either store it into the packet or it's going to adjust the timestamps in the packet so that uh, it is compensated for. Pretty much the same concept is used in this uh, precision time protocol which is over internet that when you buy uh, switches and routers which claim to be uh, PTP compliant, they internally keep track of this. So they adjust the timestamps to compensate for the delay that might have happened within the switch because switch has queues, etc. Et so, uh, so what one can begin to uh, sort of com compensate for this thing. The timestamping mechanism, um, as I already mentioned, uh, on the radio chips and uh, a very common thing now find is uh, some sort of some sort of a pin which indicates an event related to departure or arrival of a packet. So for example, a very simple radio from PI, uh, every time a byte arrives, okay, uh, while it is still sitting in the queue within the radio and all, uh, it basically sends up a signal. Uh, TI's radios which are for the ZigBee or 802.15.4 standard, uh, they have something called start of frame delimiter. So in the packet, there's a preamble and then the main packet. So they're at the boundary when the actual packet starts, uh, they generate a signal which corresponds to uh, uh, that specific location in the packet and then both sides transmit as an instrument. In Wi-Fi, uh, people have, uh, like I said, there are uh, these are less commonplace, but people have been hacking through. So I've seen work where on Wi-Fi chips in cars, they have kind of tried to re repurpose something for this purpose uh, to, get, to extract this kind of information. So, um, so bottom line is we can do timestamping. How good this timestamping is, it turns out we can get down to, in case of the 802.15.4, you can get down to half a microsecond, maybe 0.1 microsecond. So what I mean by that is you can measure a particular point in the packet as it is leaving your radio or as it is arriving at the radio down to that level of uh, spread, okay, uncertainty. Okay, so, um, so this basically shows um, uh, what the limiting factor then becomes. So what this is showing is some data uh, collected by uh, someone on uh, 
how deterministic these delays are. Okay, so now we are doing this low level time stamping, making use of those special pins. What you see out here is some specific transmitter and some particular receiver of that model. And on the bottom one, same transmitter but a different receiver. So it's just showing uh, some variation that might exist. And then finally, between those two receivers. Okay. And what you see out here is that it is a spread. So in this particular case, what it is, the experiment was transmitter sends a packet, receiver gets the packet, they are both generating that signal, that signal you feed to some test instrument, and on that test instrument you are measuring what that delay was. Okay, so it's just happening on a lab bench, so to say. <coughs> what you see out here is that between this pair of radios, um, sort of a Gaussian kind of behavior, 3.15 microsecond mean roughly, and there's a spread of around 0.1 microsecond. Okay, now looking at this, what you can say is the following that if I do repeated packet transmissions, then I can learn the mean and subtract that away, but I still have to deal with this variance. That means any given offset measurement that I talked about earlier is going to see a variance which relates to uh, the, uh, the spread uh, in the signal. And that is, that is fundamental in the sense that that's your measurement noise, okay. Uh, now, it looks Gaussian, so that's good. Uh, why is that good? If I have a sensor with Gaussian noise, must be recorded. It's easier to do the noise. Yeah, yeah, by repeated measurements, right? Uh, so, uh, so, uh, so, I, what this carries is the hope that I can do repeated measurements and thereby uh, compensate for this. Now, the thing is, the, the, the snag is that uh, the process is not stationary, right? I mean, over time, the drifts themselves are changing and all, but over short time intervals, if I do multiple measurements, uh, then I can begin to, uh, begin to remove the effect of the noise. Uh, so, so, I guess the main takeaway I wanted to leave you with this thing out here is that the evil is not the absolute value. The evil is the spread because absolute value I can learn to <coughs> remove. Uh, it's the spread is something that you are always going to have in every measurement. But since, the sp uh, since it seems to be kind of somewhat well behaved, repeated measurements are going to be your friend. So, you, so now what you can imagine is I want to measure the offset. I do a bunch of quick measure exchanges and average them out, okay. I cannot, uh, okay, so when I say quick, it is quick relative to the frequency, the time scale at which the drift changes, okay. So now it depends upon how stable my environment is. If I'm sitting in, if the nodes are sitting in somewhat temperature control setting and they are not accelerating, there are basically two things which affect frequency characteristics of crystals tremendously. One is temperature and the other is acceleration. Uh, acceleration deforms the crystals and temperature again shrinks or expands the crystals. Um, so uh, as long as you're not subject, subjecting the clock hardware to that, you, are, uh, you can, you can uh, compensate for this. Okay, so, uh, so this determinism matters and uh, the point I made just short below, Gaussian this behavior is kind of good um, because we can uh, remove it by repeated measurement over short kind of time scales, and we can of course also model, simulate all those kind of nice things that uh, uh, follow. The challenge though is that it takes time to send those, to make those measurements. Each one of those measurements is basically the act of sending a packet and we'll actually see shortly that it also involves sending Backward. That's why you measure the offsets. Um, it takes channel bandwidth on 8.15.4, that's standard, which is used quite a bit in sensing applications. Each packet is probably going to eat up a few milliseconds, a millisecond, let's say. So if all you are doing is these repeated exchanges, you are occupying the channel. Uh, so you want to minimize that, okay? Um, but if you do it, if you do those estimate too infrequently, the problem you run into is that in between your measurement, one measurement and the next measurement, the clock characteristics themselves have changed. It 
the curve will not look like this. So you want to do that frequently enough, but not too frequently. Um, so, uh, uh, so, so that's some, somehow we need to kind of reconcile that. Uh, so with this, there are a few ways that have emerged on organizing this message exchange. And what I'm presenting to you is sort of the simpler forms. I think in recent years, there are better methods that have emerged, uh, which, uh, but fundamentally the goal is now the following. So let's start with a simpler problem. I have two nodes or a, a, a transmitter and a few receivers, and I want to synchronize them. Okay, and the question is, how should I structure the messaging so that I can achieve those goals, synchronize the clock, learn the clock drift behavior, while minimizing the number of packets I have in the exchange. So one common way of structuring this, dates back to 90s, is the so-called receiver-receiver type model. And the basic idea is along the following lines, that uh, let, let me just do it while we have the second slide. Uh, so the basic idea is the following, that there is some sender, and at some point in time, it is going to send out a packet. And then every receiver, which is in its neighborhood, is going to uh, uh, timestamp when it observes the packet. So the same packet, receiver one may say, hey, I saw it at time t equal to four, Receiver two may say, I saw it at time t equal to five. And then these two receivers can talk to each other and say, you know, that event, event with hash, well, whatever, uh, uh, ID number i, uh, I saw it at t equal to four. The other guy say, hey, I saw it at t equal to five. Uh, so our clocks must be one second apart. Okay, so it's equivalent to a bell rings. I consult my watch, say it happened at time t1. You consult your watch, you say it happens at time t1 prime. So then by exchanging t1 and t1 prime, I can, I can figure that. Uh, so originally, this was a system called season spray, uh, but then a reinvention of sorts of this happened at UCLA uh, the resistance group uh, in 2003-04 in context of transcendence. But the basic concept is this. Now this has some interesting uh, and nice uh, properties. Uh, so the nice property is the following: that. Imagine, uh, consider the sender. Does, remember I talked about the packet goes through layers of software and Mac protocols and things like that. The big delay usually in this thing is the medium access control protocol because depending upon if a channel is very busy, the packet may sit there for a long time. In this scheme, that delay does not matter because we don't care when the sender sent the packet. All we care is that we both, the two receivers, agree upon the same packet. We don't, they don't care when the packet was actually sent. So this is great if the sender has no way of time stamping accurately, okay? Uh, because they, it doesn't need to time stamp, it just needs to put time. Uh, so in settings where uh, you fundamentally lack the ability to time stamp outgoing packets accurately, uh, receiver receiver kind of an approach is great because the sender time stamping doesn't need to be done. So the issue now becomes what is the uncertainty on the two receivers? If the two receivers have equal uncertainty, that is, by the time they get the packet from the point it was emitted by the transmitter, if the delay to both paths is exactly the same, then the accuracy would be perfect. The problem in real life that would happen is. Firstly, the two nodes may not be equidistant from the receiver, uh, from the transmitter. One may be very close, other may be far away. Uh, so the travel time may be different. Uh, the second thing is these two nodes themselves may have different characteristics. They may be different models of radios and things like that. Uh, and then software issues and all again. So the idea, uh, the issue is that the point in time when one radio receives the packet and timestamps it and the other radio receives and timestamps it may not be the same, and that's the source of error. So this error becomes problematic uh, or begins to dominate one uh, in certain settings. One, 
you are looking at long range radio. So imagine cellular. One radio may be a couple of miles away, the other radio may be right next to the base station. Uh, if you are underwater, because in underwater, the, instead of speed of light, you are talking about speed of sound, and therefore the time difference. And thirdly, if the radio hardwares are dramatically different. But if you are working in relatively homogeneous and short range settings, let's say Wi Fi or something like that, this is a beautiful scheme because transmit delay is eliminated. I don't need low level access to timestamp. If I did, terrific on the receive side, but the receive side delays in the radio hardware tend to be relatively minor, uh, but the big delay has been eliminated. So this is receiver receiver kind of scheme and you can uh, as you can see it has this uh, certain certain uh, certain advantages the second scheme is the so called sender receiver scheme which is a more common one and this involves two message exchanges and kind of the idea is that it seeks to uh, simultaneously learn propagation delay and also the clock offset. So this is how it works. At some point in time, one of the nodes initiates an exchange. And what it does is it sends out a packet at time t1 according to its local clock. Uh, and we have figured out a way of time stamping T1, which is a very low level time sensitive system. The second node B is going to receive the packet at some time T2 according to its local clock. And if you think about it, T2 is going to be equal to T1 plus the delay from 1 to 2 plus the offset. Okay? Now, looking at this, unfortunately, I I have two unknowns. I don't know the delay and I don't know the offset. So I really cannot solve this equation. Let's, for the sake of argument, let's imagine I make multiple such transmissions. So I send T2, uh, I send one packet and then he sends another packet and then he sends another packet. So he's sending a whole bunch of T2, T1 pairs and then I have a whole bunch of delay and offsets. Now, in this particular case, uh, Let's imagine that offset and uh, we, we, can, we, can, we can make some assumptions about what remains constant and what is changing. So let's say we make the uh, uh, argument that delay remains constant. Then what I can begin to do is by making repeated messages like this, I can begin to measure how offset was changing. If offset was unchanging, then every pair of T2 and T1 would be such that T2 minus T1 was constant. Assuming delay was constant. But if T2 and T1 are not, uh, uh, if the T2 minus T1 was changing, or if absolute value of T2 and T1 was changing, that means offset is changing. So if my only interest was to measure how the clock was drifting, which is D over DT of offset, then I can make repeated one way messages, and then this risk node B can learn the clock offset. Sorry, can learn the clock drift. How its clock is changing as a function of uh, related to A's clock, and then maybe you can send a message back to A saying these are our relative characteristics. But that's not the problem we are currently solving. Our current problem is I want to estimate the offset. So, what's our solution? One solution is we pre measure the delay, we pre characterize the delay. And then plug it in, I can get the offset. But the problem that you face then is that what if I'm talking to an unknown radio? What if the delay itself is not something I can pre characterize because maybe the signal can take different jobs and all? Uh, so let's imagine uh, somehow measuring uh, the delay also. So the approach that produces the following we basically say B now sends a packet back to A. In that packet, B will also include T1 and T2, but it also includes T3, the time at which it sends the second packet back. And then packet will be received at A at T4, and now the equation would be T4 equal to T3 plus delay minus offset. 
and now you can solve it offset equal to this delay equal to this um, there are couple of issues which uh, well three issues which uh, cause problems out here one is our measurement of t1 t2 t3 t4 are not perfect as we discussed earlier they, they have time stamp issues second thing is we are making an assumption that delay in two directions is the same it doesn't have to be uh, it usually is not particularly uh, links are very asymmetric your cellular link uh, almost any link going to the base station is more delay prone than coming back from the base station um, and then finally we are also making an assumption that offset remain constant in between these two which again depends upon how drifty your blocks <coughs> are and when what you are transmitting stack back so three issues there uh, timestamp not perfect uh, delays are not symmetric and offsets are not constant but if you assume that all of these things are uh, if delay is symmetric and offset is uh, and offset is uh, uh, constant, then I can indeed solve solve for this. So the main insight out here is the following, yeah, and uh, that is fundamentally impossible to measure one-way delay in a network if your clocks are not synchronized. Okay, so think about it. Let's say your task is to measure the one-way delay from node A to node B in a network and your clocks are not synchronized, then it's not possible. It's not possible to decouple whether the difference in clocks is because the delay was large and offset was small or delay was small and offset is large. The delay and offset appear the same in a same particular Manner. If let's say I send a packet to you and you receive it what appears to be an hour later, uh, is it because it indeed took an hour or is it because our clocks are shifted? Now that decoupling cannot, cannot be done. Uh, I have seen some papers in recent year or two where there seem to be some claims about that you can do it. I don't quite understand them because when I follow you know, the map and all, it's, it's a logical impossibility unless you have some other kind of a side information. But basically, mathematically, given just a single equation, there is no way you can solve for both. Okay, you have you can place bounds. You can basically say, hey, I know that delays are at most so much, and I know uh, something about what the offsets might be, uh, but that's the extent to which you can. So it's fundamentally impossible to accurately infer one-way delay in a packet if you do not have some independent way of synchronizing the clock or perhaps some other external clock which is able to look at events in both places. Uh, but by making these assumptions that delay is symmetric and offset remains constant, you can do a two-way measurement and then you can measure Measure this, measure this thing. So this is the strategy which NTP uses and a whole bunch of other protocols use that. Uh, namely, make this assumption and then kind of uh, work, work, work through that. Uh, this, I think a version of this problem where you also potentially can say delay in forward direction is a multiple of the delay in the backward direction and we know that multiple. Again, you can solve this thing. But but you need to know something about that. Otherwise. So, which one do you think will be better? Receiver, receiver, sender, receiver? And why? So again, sender, uh, here we are solving this particular way. And uh, here the approach was sender doesn't matter. The receivers get the packet and they exchange information. Now, obviously, if sender timestamping is horrible, then receiver-receiver wins, right? Because if sender timestamping is horrible, that's another way of saying that T, T1 and T4 have a lot of noise in them, okay? Uh, and whereas this guy doesn't have to deal with sender timestamps, it only has to worry about the receiver timestamps. So, 
ignoring that issue, uh, let's say timestampings were of comparable quality. Uh, what do you think uh, are then the relative merits? Which one would you use? Let's say a very good timestamping. Yeah. Huh? And why? Uh, but I didn't need the timestamp and receiver receiver, so in some senses that's yeah, no, equivalent. Wait, are you saying that the timestamp on the sender is good? Yeah, I'm saying let's imagine timestamp is good now, okay? But in receiver receiver, the timestamp is as if the time timestamp is not needed. So just from that argument alone, it doesn't follow that sender receiver is better now. Well, but um, then you don't need you don't need to receive twice. Uh, true, I don't need to receive twice in the sense that two nodes don't need to receive, yeah. uh, but why does that matter? I'm uh, strictly focusing on the quality of, uh, so, so that the thing out here is the following, that in this case, it's these two nodes which are syncing with each other, right? And whereas in this case, those two nodes are syncing with each other. So I guess maybe think of my question as the following, in which case, uh, assuming timestamps are good, uh, in which case, are the two nodes involved, namely the two receivers here, the sender receiver there, are synced to a higher quality. Receiver, receiver? Why is that? Because there are two variances delay You have two variances. So they add up. Um, I don't see it. You have two variances here also, each one of them. Uh, I would say sender receiver because uh, you essentially, because the center timestamps don't matter in receiver receive, so you, in this center receiver case, I think you created a relationship between when this sends and receives and when that sends and receives. So they're, they're probably, you have more measurements and you can synchronize specifically with these two nodes better. Okay, so you're saying there are more measurements. And that's thing at all. In, in terms of number of measurements is similar, uh, so that's not an issue. There are some other pragmatics which come into play, like for example, let's say I was not interested in just synchronizing two nodes, but I was interested in synchronizing n nodes. So in this case, what will happen is sender will send out a packet to n minus one nodes, and each one of them are going to send a packet back. Okay, so the for so I need one packet going, n minus one coming back. Whereas in this particular case, what will happen is this guy is going to send our packet, everyone receives it, but now they need to talk to each other, right? And there will be at least n minus one, uh, sorry, there will be, yeah, at least n minus one, let's say, at least n exchanges, right? One of them may send out its timestamp to uh, collect the timestamp from everyone and then broadcast the offset to everyone, right? So in both cases, there are n transmissions. So that even out. okay? So number of packet exchanged is similar. Uh, yeah, the main thing is this this one actually does better because of this factor of two. So every error in timestamp that remains out here and every error in propagation delay or any other such things that are creeping in, they are all getting divided by two, whereas here is just direct thing. So it ends up having a factor of two advantage. Again, assuming timestamps are good. Okay, if if on the other hand T1 and T3, T1 and T4 dominate, then this is going to take a bigger hit. Um, so anyway, that's uh, uh, that's the thing. So with the low-level timestamping, the regime in which this wins is basically limited to cases where you are unable to do low-level timestamping, and that happens. Like for example, like I said, you're working in Wi-Fi, or the radio is just not under your control. Um, oftentimes, you have radios which connect to your computer over a serial port or something like that. So those those are situations. Uh, but otherwise, generally speaking, this thing is going to win out because of that factor of two. Um, uh, so that's uh, this one issue. Uh, the second issue in which both schemes suffer from is the following: that in this scheme, so these guys are going to receive the packet and then they have to reconcile. In this scheme, there's a packet coming this way and then a packet going back. If, if your clocks are drifting very rapidly, then in between that time period, my, my offset has actually changed, okay? And uh, this would usually happen in communications which are over slow medium. So uh, the most common example is underwater networks because they are acoustic, very low bit rate. Uh, so 
there is a modification of both these schemes where basically you say I'm going to assume I have a current model of clock drift which I have learned based upon prior measurements so in this case I can measure or I can every time I measure offset I can learn how the offset was changing and let's say I set a linear or a quadratic function to that so I have some knowledge of how the offset changes and then I can incorporate that additional term out here to account for how much time has passed in in between the two directions and I can do something similar out here so by explicitly modeling the clock and then comparing it against that uh, the possibility NTP does something similar uh, what NTP does is it maintains a clock model and then every time it does this message exchange it basically says what I would have expected versus based upon my clock model and what I'm actually seeing and then it sort of updates based upon that so uh, bottom line then is the uh, factor of two advantage sort of kicks in that's what this slide is an attempt to show that in sender receiver uh, because of this two-way message exchange you end up having somewhat of an advantage over so um, uh, so so this is the way this is the setting under which I did not know the delay so I'm actually estimating the delay as part of the offset, but with the assumption that delay is symmetric, which may or may not be true. Uh, uh, the more popular protocol uh, currently uh, is uh, FTST, or flood, flooding time synchronization, and it's progenies. Um, uh, it basically instead takes the approach that we have pre-characterized the delays okay so experimentally kind of you measure the delay and all and then plug that in so in that case the big advantage is I don't even need to make the reverse direction trip I just characterize and to the extent my characterized delay is good I'll, I'll get a good result so uh, these guys back in back in 2004 5 time frame were basically showing uh, sort of some microsecond level accuracies um, and a few microsecond over a multi hop network. So it was it was pretty good. Uh, the basic strategy, the way FTSP works, it's a, it's a package you can download and run on a variety of platforms. There is a root node in the network, it sends out a packet, and then the first hop nodes are going to hear it. What they are going to do is they are going to timestamp its arrival. And then they are going to send that packet out and timestamp its departure. And then the delay that happened at that node, they are going to compensate, they are going to put that in the payload set. Okay, so this information propagates. So essentially, any node, what it gets now is when it received the packet and how much delay was spent along the way uh, at the nodes. The only thing remaining is the propagation delay. And then it does the receiver receiver type system. So, uh, pretty good number, uh, very old type radio, uh, relatively slow radio, uh, 6 microsecond per hop, so it was, it was, it was pretty darn good. Um, uh, they, the basic approach they had was they would send out the packet every 30 seconds or so kind of thing. Variants of this scheme in many ways are uh, currently, currently in use. <coughs> Um, I'm going to skip the next two slides, uh, next three slides, uh, actually. Uh, this is actually showing that uh, how the three approaches that we basically in effect have discussed. One is receiver-receiver, the other is sender-receiver but assuming symmetry of delays. And finally, sender receiver assuming pre calibrated delays. And what you see is receiver receiver 2.8 microsecond uh, uh, spread. Um, yeah, this one 1.8, so it's not quite a factor of 2 because there's some other, and this guy 1.4 uh, microsecond. And again, th this, this, this is from an old radio, but uh, at this stage, applying these kind of schemes with modern radios and very careful calibration and all you can get to 0.1 microsecond, perhaps even um, getting close to 
20, 30 nanosecond kind of thing with uh, careful tracking of delays and stuff like that. So one, 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 one can do quite, quite well. Uh, into a regime where your ability to measure what is happening is uh, coarser than what actually is happening. And then groups in the wired regime using, again, carefully pre-calibrated delays and all. I think I had mentioned that folks at CERN, uh, because they need to synchronize things uh, along their particle accelerator, uh, so they get into a few picosecond time, time synchronization over order of 10 to 20 miles, okay? And what they do is they do a very precise calibration of the fiber optic cable and everything so that they know very precisely the delays and and compensate for it. Every piece of hardware is carefully calibrated, of course, therefore, as a result, extremely costly. Um, the thing to remember out here is that atomic clocks and all are not going to solve the problem by themselves out here because they give you a stable frequency source. They, your problem of measuring the clock offset is still there. And that really boils down to careful accounting of all the delays and time stamping as precisely as you can. Clocks have nothing to do, uh, nothing to do with other than the fact that if your message exchange is too slow, then clocks themselves are drifting uh, during that period. But so to that extent, stable clocks are good. But otherwise, this is basically fundamentally a problem of can I, can, can we set the watches uh, to the same time value? And that's, that's a hard problem. So, so that's one. Now, the second thing that I left unsaid out there is, uh, what is the clock model? Uh, so, uh, clocks drift, and we, uh, there are two reasons we need a clock model. One is that, as we talked about, that in each one of these schemes that we saw, like uh, this guy, uh, between the two message exchanges, the clock may drift, and therefore offset will change. And the other is, I cannot keep doing this message exchange at a very rapid rate. It's going to take a lot of spectrum or a lot of bandwidth, as well as it is going to uh, eat up energy. So I want to minimize how often we are doing this. And in between synchronize, in between these events, I, I'm open loop. So what has happened is that some time ago, we made our last measurement. And we had a bunch of measurements before that. Some time has passed since then. Now I need to say, what's the time at the other node? So clocks have drifted. So what we need is some sort of a model capturing how the clocks are drifting so that we can go and compensate for it. So that brings to kind of the last piece of this puzzle, which is modeling the, uh, which is modeling the clocks uh, themselves. So uh, in a sense, uh, 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 it basically talk, uh, clock drift in terms of uh, in our terminology would be the rate at which the counters of the two nodes are drifting away. So if I think of the two counters, uh, then I can always find a relative error. Yes. Now, it turns out that the main factor for uh, uh, clocks to change is temperature. The other one is acceleration, as I mentioned, but acceleration becomes an issue only with certain applications where you mount sensors on propellers or stuff like that, but in other cases, it's temperature. Temperature doesn't change very rapidly. So what that means is over short time intervals, tens of seconds, a few minutes at least, uh, your temperature is constant, and therefore, the frequency error is constant, and therefore, the time between two nodes is going to drift away linearly. So if I think in terms of time at node A and time at node B, then assuming you buy into my argument that temperature is stable over the time interval, then what we would, and, and that there are no other sources, then we would expect the real time offset between them to drift linearly. And what we are doing when we are doing that offset measurement is that we are sampling this line. So at different points in time, I'm making a measurement as to how far, what was the actual offset. But this offset is changing linearly. Okay, so, so essentially the problem now is that we are sensing a phenomenon, which instead of being constant and I'm making multiple measurements and I can average it out, instead of that, I'm monitoring a phenomenon which is changing linearly and I'm sampling that. 
So, uh, so that's basically what's going on. Each one of these viewpoints is representing a measurement, but it's measuring a process which is evolving linearly in time. And my goal is to come up with a model of the underlying, underlying uh, process. And uh, that is something of the form A plus B times time. So uh, this is the usual linear regression or best fit line kind of a problem. Uh, so that's how uh, uh, things are. Uh, uh, th things can be done. So essentially, uh, very crudely speaking, the approach then becomes that uh, we uh, our measurements that we are making using those handshakes are giving us estimates of offset at different points in time, and then we assume that the underlying process is linear, and then come up with a model for this underlying state. Um, some papers and all show that going to quadratic is somewhat better. So there are some nonlinear effects that kick in. But to the first order, uh, this thing is a reasonable, reasonable approach to take. OK, so, um, so, so then the way these schemes are basically boiled down is there's a clock model, uh, which, as I said, <coughs> linear regression or quadratic is a first cut thing. You do either receiver receiver or sender receiver message exchange. They give you the clock offsets, but those clock offsets are really measurements of this underlying changing process. And then you do some sort of a model fitting to get that model, and then uh, use. Uh, then you can do smarter things like use the uncertainty in that model to guide how frequently you are going to take the samples. If my temperature is stable, if the slope of that thing is small, then perhaps I can have my samples fall apart. If the slope is very rapid, I can take more samples. All those kind of gains can be done. Um, there are certain other issues that one also has to uh, worry about, uh, uh, which also sort of end up missing things. So, and that has to do with what are the sources of these errors that we are seeing. Okay, so sources of these errors we saw previously included the timestamping related errors errors relating to the delay estimates, uh, if the delay is pre-characterized or asymmetry in the delay. Uh, there is another source of error, which is quantization errors. Uh, we measure these times using some finite precision counters. And so uh, depend and, and, and some oscillator of certain frequency. So if my local oscillator has very low frequency, or if my counter has few, it's, uh, counter uh, or equivalent to say counter has uh, doesn't have that much resolution, then my timestamps are going to be coarse, okay? And that is going to introduce a quantization error also. So there's a bunch of errors which sort of creep in out here, which uh, one has to do careful accounting for. So what turns out is the following, uh, is the following that at very low regimes, very, uh, you tend to be limited by quantization errors. That dominates. Whereas, uh, that is uh, what I mean by that is if you're synchronizing very rapidly, if I'm doing lots of message exchanges very frequently, <coughs> then the effect of temperature is not going to be felt because temperature isn't changing much. But what would be felt is the quantization. Whereas, on the other hand, if you are in the regime where you synchronize relatively rarely, every few minutes, half an hour, hour, then temperature effects begin to dominate and quantization error doesn't because quantization error is now over longer time durations. So its role goes down, but temperature effects begin to dominate. So which error, which one of these two errors you have to worry more about, quantization or temperature, depends upon how frequently you are synchronizing. And it turns out that there will actually be some sort of a sweet spot of what's the optimum time synchronization, uh, which is a function of these two things. You look clock frequency and how drifty the clocks are or equivalently how rapidly changing the temperature is. And that in turn is a function of your deployment. So if your node is sitting inside Boulder Hall in a nice AC lab, it's going to be very different than if you put it out on uh, outside and during nighttime the temperature plummets, during daytime. So over a very short interval, the sun sets or shade comes, the clock can drift uh, over a matter of minutes. Uh, 
So bunch of these issues sort of uh, therefore come into uh, come into play. Um, I already mentioned this part, so I'm going to skip over it. But uh, in certain regimes like uh, satellite communication and underwater, latency is very high. And in those settings, receiver receiver takes a big hit because when latency is high, then even minor differences in distance from the sender can translate into huge differences in the path delay. And receiver receiver takes a much bigger hit in that case. Uh, underwater sensor networks are quite common now for petroleum industry and all, and they talk using acoustic links, which are 10 bit, 100 bit, maybe if you're lucky, a kilobit per second. Very slow links, very high latency. Uh, and their uh, time synchronization takes its own sort of separate flavor. And uh, usually, the main thing is to consider the drift during synchronization itself. So while you are sending the message, just during that period, because it may take seconds for the message to go through, the clocks have drifted and you need to sort of compensate for that. So there's been work in that direction. Some folks at USC who work a lot on petroleum and all they kind of do explicit compensation for that. Okay, let's see how are we doing time. Okay. Uh, the, among the recent developments, so I mentioned uh, the whole CERN activity, which goes under the name of White Rabbit and which have pulled things down to picoseconds. The other big development in recent times has been this new standard called Precision Time Protocol, or IEEE 1588. So as you can see, it's seven, seven years old uh, at this stage, but only over the past four or five years has it begun to penetrate the products. Um, so, what 1588 explicitly targeted, uh, excuse me, I think. So what 1588 explicitly target, targeted was the regime of synchronizing devices over a local area network. So the theory uh, or the motivation was the following. You could use NTP, and NTP can get you down to milliseconds, but NTP was never designed for this regime. NTP was designed for a wide area network. And uh, the other thing is NTP never made use of uh, and NTP basically does timestamping at the software level. So uh, there's an app running, <coughs> sort of packet, timestamps it using get time of day, things like that. So it's kind of just sitting at a high level. What 1588 sought to do was really optimize things very heavily to achieve microsecond, sub microsecond, uh, perhaps tens of nanosecond type uh, accuracy over a local area network. So one challenge which comes is the following. Uh, in the sender receiver, I had said that uh, when the packet is going out, it carries with it the timestamp at which it was sent. It sounds easy, but it's extremely hard because imagine you are using gigabit per second Ethernet, your packet symbols are going out very rapidly, you are timestamping it, and you have to insert the timestamp as the packet is going out. It's impossible for software. Uh, but even for hardware to make this thing happen is pretty hard because not only do you have to insert the timestamp, then you have to recompute the error code, the, the CRC check, and put that at the end. So what 1588 does is the following. Um, I'm sorry, this figure has not come out well as I had hoped.
Okay. No. So one of the changes that 1588 made is the following. Instead of requiring that the packet carries a timestamp with it, they have a theme, <coughs> they have a message exchange that involves more messages. So this is what happened in 1588. There's a master clock for reference. Uh, the slave that uh, we seek the slave to know the time. What happens is the master sends out a packet. It's called a sync message. The slave receives it at some time t2 according to its clock, according to slave clock. Meanwhile, what the master does is it follows up a little bit later, carrying in this second packet timestamp at which the first packet went out. So, right, so this way we eliminate the problem of having to insert a timestamp exit timestamp as the packet is going out. So now what happens is slave has received two packets. It got the initial packet, which it had timestamp. In the second packet, it also got the information when the master sent the packet. So it got the value of T1. And then what the slave does is, at some time T3, according to its clock, it will send a packet out, uh, which would be received by the master at T4. And the master would send this thing back, carrying T4. So at this stage, the slave has T1, T2, T3, T4, and then using the same set of equations that we talked about previously and the same set of assumptions that delay is symmetric and all, it basically computes uh, things out. To make this magic work, the other thing that 1588 does is, uh, it basically says that anything which can cause asymmetries, uh, let's deal with that. And so this is happening over a LAN which means that the packets may be going through intermediate switches. And uh, uh, so either hubs or switches, so dumb, dumb hubs or smart switches. And each one of them also provides the adjustment to these timestamps. So at the end of the day, the slaves have adjusted timestamps. And then using that, it computes the offsets. And the accuracies are such that uh, if you do it carefully, you can get it down to tens of nanoseconds uh, there, and your limit then becomes the cabling delays. Everything else is kind of factored out. So this is this is a pretty uh, sort of rapidly getting adopted. You can find 1588 capabilities built into Ethernet uh, chips, which are there even on a lot of the standard platforms. Uh, the problem usually is software doesn't support it, but there is excellent support for 1588 now on Linux. So on platforms that have the requisite hardware, Linux can support 1588 at the stage. Uh, so you basically replace PTP, sorry, you replace NTP by PTP. The problem with PTP is it's local area. So it's not intended for you to synchronize with a machine on the East Coast or things like that. It's really within a local area setting. 100 nanosecond level with two second updates and over local areas. Uh, you can go down to 20 nanosecond type stuff with faster sampling and cleverer modeling of the clocks, okay, um, uh, clocks and clock pairs. Um, there are still issues that remain, but foremost limitation at this stage is the asymmetry in the cable delay. So you literally you buy a cable, Ethernet cable, the usual CAT5, CAT6 CAT cable, and some wires are carrying signal in one direction, and some of the wires in it carry the signal in other direction. In that cable, you will find asymmetry of the delays, okay, which just comes from the parasitic things that exist within, within this. Um, so, so that's 1588, and that represents uh, in the wired setting the best that is out there. And there is 1588 over wireless, which is also people are exploring. Uh, then your other thing, which is limiting uh, accuracy of synchronization, are the oscillators themselves. And I have covered this point before, but you can basically uh, TCXOs and better form of oscillators uh, uh, are your answer. And the main thing really is stability versus power uh, trade-off. So what you see out here, for example, is 32 kilohertz oscillator, 100 ppm microwatts. Uh, 
you look at 8 megahertz crystal oscillator, 25 ppm, so it's better than ppm, uh, but a milliwatt power. Um, uh, you can go to a TCXO, you can get 1 ppm, uh, 21 milliwatt power, and of course, a lot costlier. And then you can go to even fancier stuff and go down to like 0.1 ppm, and they'll probably be like half a watt or so. So there's a, uh, you basically pay for power and cost, uh, power, pay in power and cost as you get better and better clocks. One thing that one can do is not to pay for these things. So one, not to pay for a temperature compensated oscillator, which tries to do things um, in hardware. And the reason TCXOs exist is that in many applications, you need temperature compensation, and you don't have access to any reference. That is, you cannot do any in situ, in field kind of calibration. But if you are in a setting where you have access to some other reference clock, then you can have a cheaper oscillator. Like, for example, maybe you can use this guy instead of the uh, standard crystal oscillator, or you can use even a lower frequency one if you have access to some other source of information. So the two obvious ones are, number one, you can have GPS. Uh, but then you are paying more for GPS and power than this, but maybe what you can do is you can put the GPS to sleep, wake it up once in a while, compensate. You can make use of network access and use a time synchronization protocol. Or the third thing that you can do is create your own TCXO. So what TCXOs fundamentally do is deep inside, this, they have a temperature sensor conceptually. They say, what's the current temperature? And based upon that, how much compensation I need to apply. If you already have a microcontroller or some software and all, then you can basically create that yourself. So what you can do is, in the initial stages of the system, you so imagine you have a cheap temperature sensor, which is pretty common. Then what you can do is, in the initial stages of the system, you calibrate against some reference, network reference. And you develop a map of temperature versus frequency correction yourself, store it in memory, and then later on compensate for it. So several different groups in past decade or so kind of came up with this kind of a concept. So essentially, in these systems, they use a cheap crystal oscillator, but then they develop a mapping from temperature to frequency correction based upon access to some reference over the network. Or you might even imagine that maybe you have a GPS uh, except once you have learned it, then you start keeping your GPS shut down for longer and longer period of time. So temperature compensated time uh, synchronization, and uh, uh, yeah, these are some plots. So uh, basic point is that you can, uh, you, can, you can improve things quite a bit. Another concept for dealing with these issues is a dual clock design. Kind of the idea is have two oscillators or two clocks, one fast, one slow, one stable, one less stable, okay, and then you duty cycle the two things. So kind of the idea is that slow crystals keep coarse time and they're always on. And then you can have a fast crystal which you turn on as and when you need high accuracy. So, and, uh, so it's kind of like uh, I don't have to use a fine grain ruler all the time if I'm measuring, if I have to go to sleep for a long time, it's kind of pointless to have a high frequency crystal running and burning power. I switch to a low frequency thing, come roughly close to where I need to be, and then I activate. So if I need to wake up at five nanosecond after 5 p.m., then instead of having a five nanosecond clock all the way through, I keep a, let's say, one second clock, come close to 5 p.m., and then activate the uh, nanosecond resolution clock, and then switch to that. So that's kind of the crude concept. Um, uh, so several sort of uh, uh, systems have explored this kind of an idea. So you uh, fast clock, slow clock, your duty cycle. Uh, and the net gain is equal performance, but at a lower power. Okay, I'm going to skip this. Uh, let's see. Another concept, uh, and again, these are ideas which from in the embedded setting people have sort of explored, is that traditionally, uh, uh, so, so think uh, a lot of time these networks are multi-hop networks. So as opposed to 
uh, a single server, everyone time to synchronize with them. We have a setting that I have a bunch of nodes and they need to synchronize with each other. So the way it works, uh, the two ideas that have been explored out here, okay. So one idea is the following, it's called post facto synchronization. So norm, uh, let's imagine the following setting. Let's say I'm expecting an event that would come asynchronously and I want to timestamp it. So one approach could be, and it's going to come at any time. So one approach is I keep my clock up and synchronized and when the event comes, I timestamp it. Except that if the event comes way into the future, I'm basically wasting energy. Post facto synchronization basically says the following, that the process of time and all these things engaged, they can go back in time also. So the concept now becomes when the event comes, I wake up my clock and then, and it's unsynchronized, but I start counting the ticks. And meanwhile, I start a synchronization with some reference. A little bit later, I would have synchronized and then I go back in time and said, okay, my clock had this much frequency error and all. And so when was, when did the event take place in past as opposed to uh, instead of keeping the clock up, up and running all the time. So I wake up the clock, start counting the ticks and in parallel calibrate the ticks and then once I have a lock on my clock, I go back in time and say, when did the event happen? Uh, so that's the concept of post-factor synchronization. <coughs> um, uh, and the other concept is the following. Uh, imagine a network, I have a bunch of nodes. Uh, what these edges represent is that these nodes can talk to each other. And between each pair of nodes, since they can talk to each other, I can make a measurement on their offsets. So I have, for example, offset measures between 1 and 2, 1 and 3, 2 and 4, 5 and 6, 6 and 7, and so on and so forth. So I have a whole bunch of offset measurements. Now let's say I want to find what is the difference, I think I get up the thing. So uh, what is the time difference between, let's say, node number 1 and node number 11? So one approach we can do is the following. I can say, okay, I can reach node number 11 by going from 1 to 2, 2 to 4, 4 to 6, 6 to 11. And therefore, I can add up the offsets along each one of them. Or I can say, hey, I can go from 1 to 4, 4 to 8, 8 to 11. That's another part. So there are, there are a whole bunch of alternative ways I can measure the offset between 1 and 11. So these kind of problems, the way they get formulated is the following. I have a bunch of pairwise measurements and I want to find an assignment of clock offsets to each one of these nodes which is the best in the sense that it best explains the measurements I had. Uh, so for example it could be 1 and 2 is 1 second, 2 and 4 is 1 second but 1 and 4 measurement gives me 2.2 seconds which one is correct 2.2 or 1 plus 1. So these multiplicity of measurements can be combined together in some optimization framework to get us a better value. Now it turns out that there are many networking problems which fall into this category. Locationing is the same way that uh, these measurements can depend, uh, indicate distance between nodes or they can indicate directions between nodes. So there are a whole bunch of problems that fall into the category that I have pairwise or subsets of measurements in a network and I want to find some property of the nodes in a manner which best explains that, that, that freedom. So a uh, fair bit of work starting again around 10 to 12 years ago where this kind of optimization problems have been explored for timing, for locationing and more recently for timing and locationing simultaneously. Uh, there are other properties of a network which fall into that category also. So you can do it much better than simply say let's just find the shortest path. You sort of try to do a global optimization across the whole network. Um, and, and, uh, so starting with some of the early work in this space was done by people like Dick Carp at Berkeley and all, but I think now there are much better, uh, much better solutions. And if one of the node has a GPS attached to it, then every node can then sync it with the GPS also. So you can achieve network network-wide time synchronization with something like this. So uh, let's see. So I'm going to stop out here. Um, uh, but 
time synchronization uh, technologies. Uh, I still have some more slides to go, so which I'll cover next time. Uh, but they have come long ways. Um, uh, the precisions that you can now achieve are pretty amazing. I mean, particularly what with careful calibration, you can get down to picoseconds and all. But even even in routine settings, if with careful design, you can achieve 0.1 microsecond or tens of nanoseconds. Uh, but that's not to say that sort of the usual, if you just take Linux, install it on a usual embedded platform and all, it's probably going to be running NTP. It's probably it's going to be highly unoptimized. So you're probably, even in a local setting, you're probably going to be seeing a few milliseconds. So there is a two, three order of magnitude gap or not more that uh, you are you are going to see. But Technologies now exist, hardware level support for time stamping, uh, these precision time protocols and these kind of algorithms which can take a holistic network view, um, kind of go, go long ways at this stage. Okay. So let's um, continue this next time.